Welcome back to Dirty Medicine's Dirty Psychiatry series. In this psychiatry video, we're going to be covering all of the disorders that you see right here on this slide. We're talking today about somatic symptom disorder, functional neurological disorder, aka conversion disorder, illness anxiety disorder, factitious disorder, and malingering. Now these diseases are really annoying for medical students and other graduate health professionals to learn because they share overlapping features with subtle differences. And if you've ever opened a review textbook or a question bank or whatever resource you like to use, you've probably seen this section of psychiatry referred to as somatic symptom and related disorders section. And I think that that's really a poor way to categorize all of these disorders. They do share overlapping features and they do need to be talked about in the same lecture, which is why I'm preparing this video today. But if you can move through this in a very methodical way that I'm going to teach you in this video, learning these disorders is really easy and they will be free points for you on test day. So I think that in order for you to understand these, you have to be able to conceptualize how you can organize these disorders if we use the dirty medicine flow chart. So I'm gonna show you how I conceptualize these and I think this will really simplify everything for you. So if you have a very basic understanding of these disorders, you probably know that these are the, the disorders that come up when something isn't quite right. So the patient may be experiencing or intentionally experiencing symptoms that are not consistent with what they should be experiencing. So where do you start with diagnosing these disorders? Well, if you're taking a test question and something doesn't smell right, that's where we start. So you, you're taking a question, you know it's they're asking you about these disorders because choices A through E are all these different uh, disorders, you know, somatic symptom disorder, conversion disorder, malingering, factitious disorder, illness, anxiety disorder. These are your answers, your possible choices. And you already know that the question is going to be about something that doesn't smell right. So in order to figure out which disorder we're talking about, the first question that you need to ask yourself is what is the experience of the symptoms? And what I'm really getting at here is, are these symptoms being experienced involuntarily or is the patient voluntarily producing these symptoms? And depending on the answer to that question, we'll be able to further categorize what disorder we're talking about. So let's focus on the left side of this flow chart. So you have a patient, they're, they're giving you the clinical vignette, there's a maybe an array of symptoms and it just doesn't smell right. You don't think that these are correct symptoms. You either think that they are being produced involuntarily or they're being produced voluntarily. So the first question that you ask yourself is, how are they experiencing these symptoms? And based on the vignette, is the patient experiencing them kind of subconsciously or involuntarily, or is the patient producing these symptoms voluntarily? And let's say for this purpose, uh, for, the, for this point in the video, that it's involuntary. So it's involuntary, we're on the left side of this flow chart. There are three different disorders that correspond to the involuntary experience of symptoms that aren't actual symptoms. And those are further broken down based on whether or not the patient is experiencing physical symptoms, neurological symptoms, or they simply have a preoccupation with symptoms. So in this case, there's three different scenarios. In each of these scenarios, the symptoms are being produced at the subconscious level, or they're being involuntarily produced by the patient. So the patient isn't going out of their way to have these symptoms, but because of some type of subconscious uh, psychiatric disturbance, the patient is having symptoms. Now, the first case is that they're having true physical symptoms. The second option is that they're having neurological symptoms. And when I say neurological symptoms, I'm referring to motor or sensory disturbances. In a vignette, this could be like they have abnormal reflexes, they have an abnormal distribution of sensory function. Anything that sounds neurologic is going to be the neurological symptoms. Anything that sounds physical or is not neurologic is going to be your first uh, physical symptom. And then the final option is that they just have a preoccupation with symptoms. And in this case, oftentimes there actually isn't any symptom. It's just a patient is worrying about the possibility of there being a symptom. And again, it's very high yield to remember that in each of these three scenarios, this is happening at the subconscious level. The patient is not volitionally or intentionally producing these symptoms. They're just happening at the subconscious level. So these are the three disorders that correspond to the involuntary experience of symptoms that don't smell right. 
Again, somatic symptom disorder is going to be your physical symptoms. Functional neurological disorder, also known as conversion disorder, is going to be the neurological symptoms. And illness anxiety disorder is preoccupation with symptoms that usually are either mild or just absent. Uh, and the patient will worry about the possibility of there being a disease. So again, all three of these involuntarily produced by the patient. Now on the other side of the flowchart, we've got the voluntary experience of symptoms that don't smell right. And the question with voluntary symptoms are which of two disorders is it? Does the patient want to be in the sick role or does the patient want some type of secondary gain? If the patient's goal is to assume the sick role, which means that they themselves want to be either the patient or the caregiver, then it's factitious disorder. And if the patient wants some type of secondary gain, such as compensation or disability insurance or escaping uh, jail time, then it's malingering. And I'm going to go through each of these diseases individually, but this is the overview. And this is how I think that you should conceptualize these disorders in order to understand what the proper diagnosis is. So again, something doesn't smell right. You ask yourself, what is the experience of symptoms? Is it involuntary or is it voluntary? If it's involuntary, the question is, do they have physical symptoms, in which case it's somatic symptom disorder? Do they have neurological symptoms, in which case it's functional neurological disorder, aka conversion? Are they worried about the possibility of having a disease and don't actually have that many symptoms, if at all, in which case it's illness anxiety disorder, which was previously called hypochondriasis, so these are your hypochondriacs? Or... Is the experience of symptoms voluntary? Is the patient going out of their way to make up symptoms so that they can either A, assume the sick role, either being the patient or the caregiver, in which case it's factitious disorder, or B, are they producing symptoms so that they get some type of secondary gain, such as time off from work, disability insurance, money, housing, etc., in which case it's malingering. Now, I would like to go through each of these individually and just talk about some of the finer details and help you differentiate them between each other. So let's start on the left and we'll move across the slide. So we're gonna start with somatic symptom disorder. The criteria for somatic symptom disorder is that it lasts for at least six months and that there's at least one real physical non-neurological symptom. So the reason I'm stressing non-neurological is because if the symptom that was experienced was a neurological symptom, then it wouldn't be somatic symptom disorder. It would be functional neurological or conversion disorder. Now in this disease and, or excuse me, in this disorder and in all of the disorders, you're going to have psychosocial impairment due to worrying about the symptoms. So you're going to see that this is a theme across all five of these diagnoses psychosocial impairment due to worrying about the symptoms. So that in and of itself is not going to differentiate any one of these from any of the rest. The clues here are that for somatic symptom disorder, it's usually going to be a female more often than a male, and they're going to have a multitude of diagnostic tests done to try to figure out what's going on. So because this exists on the subconscious level and the patients aren't intentionally producing these symptoms, but they're actually experiencing real true symptoms, they're very concerned, so they're going to get a big workup. They're going to get lots of CAT scans, MRIs, x-rays, lab work, you name it. So you're going to see a big workup in the clinical vignette, and usually this will be a female. Now, the thing that I want to point out here for somatic symptom disorder is that it's at least one real physical symptom. And again, this is important to differentiate because this is pretty much identical to illness anxiety disorder. The only difference is that in somatic symptom disorder, they actually have a real physical symptom. But in illness anxiety disorder, all of the criteria is otherwise the same, right? It's at least six months. It causes extreme psychosocial impairment due to worrying or anxiety about the symptoms. But in illness anxiety disorder, it's the same exact criteria, but the symptoms are usually absent or mild. So it's very high yield to understand this. If you're taking your test and the patient has been worrying about some kind of illness or symptom for at least six months, it's usually going to be a female. It's usually going to be somebody who gets a big workup because they're concerned. How you differentiate is whether or not they have the actual symptom. Do they have a real symptom and they're worrying about it, in which case it's somatic symptom disorder, or are they worrying about a symptom or a diagnosis that is usually either absent or mild, in which case it's illness anxiety disorder? So being able to differentiate the two based on whether or not there's at least one real non-neurological symptom is incredibly high yield and important to do on test day. So that's illness anxiety disorder versus somatic symptom disorder. 
the last of the involuntary disorders on this side of the flow chart is functional neurological disorder, also known as conversion disorder. And for conversion, the criteria is that there's at least one abnormal neurological sign or symptom. It's not better explained by another diagnosis. And again, like all of the disorders here, it causes psychosocial impairment due to worrying about the symptoms. Now, for your functional neurological disorder or your conversion disorder, it's usually in a 10 to 35 year old. And I know that that's sort of a wide range, but that's simply what they'll give you on test day. So those are the three that are the involuntary side of my flow chart. And again, what I think is really important to remember is that in all of the involuntary somatoform disorders, the patients are going to have worry and anxiety. And I'm really repeating this and harping on this because on tests, medical students and other graduate health professionals hear anxiety and worry, and they immediately pick illness anxiety disorder, incorrectly thinking that that's the only disorder on this a flow chart where you can worry about what's going on. And that's simply not true. In all of these disorders, the patient's going to have worry, they're going to have anxiety, even if they're doing it voluntarily, right? If they're going to have factitious disorder and malingering, which we'll talk about in just a second, they're going to inappropriately produce anxiety and worry. So the presence of having anxiety or psychosocial impairment is not going to differentiate these for you. Again, remember, Real physical symptoms, somatic symptom disorder. Non, non-present symptoms, but just worrying about them, is going to be illness anxiety disorder. Real neurological symptoms is going to be functional neurological disorder. So now that I've cleared that up, let's move on to the right side of this flow chart, the voluntary side. So in this case, you've got something doesn't smell right, and then the patient is voluntarily producing symptoms or signs that aren't really there at baseline. The question is... What's their goal here? That's how you differentiate factitious disorder from malingering. So in factitious disorder, the criteria is that the patient is intentionally falsifying symptoms. Their goal here is to assume the sick role. These patients have some type of history or personality disorder that makes them want to be cared for or want, want to get attention. And to that extent, they'll either do this to themselves, so make themselves sick so that they can be the patients, or they'll make someone else sick. It could be someone like an elderly uh, parent that they take care of or an innocent child that is unable to care for themselves. And if they make another person sick, then it can be factitious disorder by proxy, okay? So the clues here is that these patients will typically have either personality disorders, a very significant and sad history of abuse, or this is really high yield, they'll have healthcare experience. There's a disproportionate number of patients that have healthcare experience that also have factitious disorder. And this is because, let's say that you have a nurse, for example, that has factitious disorder. The nurse might have so much experience with administering medications and giving shots and IVs that it's really easy for her to give herself something that would make her sick. And the classic test question is going to be your female nurse who has hypoglycemia. So they're injecting insulin. And this is a really cool question because it actually connects psychiatry to endocrine. And they're going to give you the C-peptide level. They're going to give you insulin levels. And you're going to have to read through that and figure out, first of all, do you understand endocrine? And can you recognize that based on the insulin levels and the C-peptide levels and the glucose level, is this the uh, self-injection of insulin or is it something like an insulinoma? That's the first step. And then the second step is if, in fact, it's someone injecting themselves with insulin, what's the diagnosis? And they'll give you factitious disorder, malingering, illness, anxiety disorder, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they'll even, even throw insulinoma or some other disease process that causes hypoglycemia into the question. So it's a really awesome way for test writers to connect endocrine to psych. So in factitious disorder, the summary is that they're, intense, they're intentionally falsifying symptoms to be the patient or the caregiver. And oftentimes, these patients will have healthcare experience. Now, again, factitious disorders can be imposed on the, your, the self, so the patient can be wanting to be the patient, or they can impose it on another. And there's an awesome documentary on HBO called Mommy Dead and Dearest, and this is the uh, picture from that documentary. And that goes through a case where, unfortunately, this young girl was the victim of her mother making her sick intentionally so that mom could assume the role of the caregiver, which is factitious disorder. So check that out. Awesome documentary. But that's factitious disorder. 
Now let's differentiate factitious disorder from malingering. So malingering is the intentional production of symptoms in order to achieve what's known as secondary gain. And secondary gain just refers to things like getting money, getting housing. If you're homeless and you want to be placed in housing, maybe you go to the hospital and make up some you know, bogus claim or intentionally break your leg so that you can go to a skilled nursing facility, something like that. So secondary gain are things like money, escaping jail time, getting disability, all that stuff is considered secondary gain. Now in malingering, this is the one where it's usually male more than female. The rest of these disorders are typically more females, but malingering is typically male. And that's easy to remember because malingering begins with an M and male begins with an M. In fact, malingering starts with M-A-L and male also starts with M-A-L. In malingering, the patient's not going to be cooperative. They're going to they're going to want this big extensive workup, but the awesome way to differentiate malingering from some of these other disorders is that in malingering and also in factitious disorder, patients are not happy by negative results. And this is incredibly high yield because if you look at my flow chart, the voluntary production of symptoms, so factitious disorder and malingering, if these patients get worked up in the hospital and they get a CAT scan, for example, and the CAT scan shows that there's absolutely nothing wrong with them, they're not going to be happy because they're intentionally producing symptoms because they have some end goal in mind. But in your patients with the involuntarily produced symptoms, so the left side of the flow chart, these patients are so relieved when they get negative test results. They still have the anxiety and the worry about what's going on, why do I have this symptom? But when they get the negative result, they're very pleased. So that's it for this video. I hope that my conceptualization of this and the flow chart is helpful to you. It's really simple if you can kind of go through these and remember what separates them from one another. But I want this to be free points for you on test day. So go through this again, really get this down. For whatever reason, these questions do come up a lot. And remember for factitious disorder and may maybe even malingering that, that test question with self-injecting insulin and being able to understand the C-peptide levels and the insulin levels, knowing if it's a true organic process, like some type of tumor, or if it's simply someone giving themselves insulin. And then once you know that, being able to put the right diagnosis or the right label on top of it. Good luck.